Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and today we're going to get into the dialogue Republic. This is probably Plato's most famous dialogue, and it's also one of the longest. It's in, you see here in this title page, I'm looking at book one. It's broken up into 10 books, and each book is what we might call today a chapter. So it's quite long, and I'm going to be doing a number of videos on this dialogue. This dialogue is generally treated in academia as a dialogue on politics, and for obvious reasons, because they're building a republic and talking about how to educate the guardians of this republic. What we're going to see is that what Plato was actually doing was creating an analogy of the city-state to the soul. And so even though on the surface he's talking about building a city-state, what he's actually doing is talking about the soul, its constitution, and how to educate the soul. What we're going to look at today is how he introduces this dialogue. And we see here I'm calling it on justice because he's introducing the topic of justice, which is what they're looking for. We're going to see in book two where he sets up that analogy that what they're looking for is justice in the soul. And so to start us off, the very first line of the dialogue, and by the way, all of my the all of my videos on on the Republic are going to draw from the translator Paul Shorey. The very first line, I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pay my devotions to the goddess. Okay, we gotta unpack this one because there's a lot here. First, Glaucon. Who is Glaucon? Glaucon, the historical person, Glaucon is the brother of Plato. Plato had two brothers. Um, Adamantus and Glaucon, and both of them are in this dialogue. So, as you could say, that Plato made his brothers famous through this dialogue. The Piraeus was a port town, I think it was on the west coast of, of Athens, and they were holding a festival for the first time. It was a festival that was already quite common in another city state named Thrace, P H R A C E, to the east of Athens. And the goddess that they're referring to is known in Thrace as Bendis. And so this festival is usually referred to as the Bendideia or the Bendidian festival. And as you can see here in Athens, the same goddess is known as Artemis. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about who she is. Okay, so about a paragraph or so into the dialogue, we see the action begins here. They said their prayers, they saw the festival, and they're starting for town when Polemarchus, the son of Cephalus, caught sight of us from a distance as we were hastening homeward. Now here's a little piece of Socrates' dialogue with Polemarchus. The Socrates, you appear to have turned your faces townward and to be going to leave us. Not a bad guess. But you see how many we are? Surely. You must either then prove yourselves the better men or stay here. Why, is there not left the alternative of our persuading you that you ought to let us go? But could you persuade us if we refuse to listen? So you see here, there's a little bit of playfulness to this conversation, but because this is a dialogue about justice, we would be remiss not to notice that this is an injustice. Polemarchus is trying to force Socrates and Glaucon to come back to his house to have a talk there. When Socrates expresses the desire to go home, Polemarchus in a rather playful way says, he's not going to listen, you can't persuade us. We refuse to even listen to you. So there's a certain injustice in the way Polemarchus is treating Socrates. And then as their conversation goes on, they start talking about later festivities. And this is where Adamantus comes in, the brother of Glaucon and Plato. He asks, do you mean to say you haven't heard that there is to be a torchlight race this evening on horseback in honor of the goddess? On horseback, that is a new idea. Will they carry torches and pass them along to one another as they race with the horses, or how do you mean? And then Polemarchus cuts in and says, that's the way of it. And besides, there is to be a night festival, which will be worth seeing. For after dinner, we will get up and go out and see the sights and meet a lot of the lads there and have a good talk. So stay and do as we ask. 
Okay, before we go on, I think I need to say a few words about this night festival because that will help us understand who these goddesses are who are being honored by these various festivals. Now, I pulled a quote out from Thomas Taylor. He was a British translator who was, he lived in the uh, 1800s and he, in addition to translating like all of Plato's work and much of Aristotle and many of the later Platonists like Proclus and Iamblichus, he did a great amount of translation, but also he himself was a practicing Platonist and he was interested in Plato in the spiritual way. That's um, very much in line with the way I approach um, Platonism. So if you're interested in this way of seeing Plato, he's another very good source. And he was also quite knowledgeable about the gods and how to understand them in the sense of what they represent metaphysically. So this is a quote from that I pulled out from his notes on this dialogue. And um, just a few points, there are a few things in brackets I want to point out before I go on. So in his translation, where Paul Shorey used the phrase night festival, he used nocturnal solemnity. So I just put this in brackets so you and relate it to what we were looking at. Also, for some reason, I just don't understand. Thomas Taylor insisted on using the Roman names for all of the goddesses, or gods and goddesses, rather than the Greek names, which makes it very confusing. So you've got to learn this whole other set of names, right? So I put the Greek names in brackets to help us out here. Okay, so we see that this night festival was called the Lesser Panathenia. And as the name implies, it was sacred to Athena. You can kind of see the name Athena here if you take this E out. And then we see that Proclus, one of the later Platonists, he observed that this goddess Athena, along with Artemis, who is the original goddess of our original festival here, they're both daughters of Zeus. They're both virgins, which is significant because when you're looking at the symbolism of mythology, you'll see that Virginity represents the process of purification or that um, function of purification. So basically, when you're trying to understand the gods and goddesses as uh, metaphysical symbols, they are personifications of divine functions. So each time you're looking at a different function, you would have a different god. That's why there are many gods, even though they're not really, even ultimately, it's all one. So they're both virgins, meaning that they're both goddesses of the function of purification. And they're both light bearers, which is symbolical of being intellectual. Now, Artemis presides over generation and is the midwife of its productive principles. But Athena elevates souls and imparts intellect to true prudence. This dialogue, the Republic, includes that famous allegory of the cave which is meant to symbolize the whole range of uh, human um, sorry, levels of intellect from ignorance all the way to wisdom. And so we start off in the cave and then we're going to be going up a steep ascent out of the cave. And then we enter, we go out into the sunlight, enter the real world, if you will, the world of absolute reality. We learn that world and then we go back down into the cave. and that way we can adjust to the darkness and we know both worlds and we can function in this world with the knowledge of that other world, knowing how the two worlds fit together. So what we see here is that Artemis presides over that first um, purification. It would be like analogous to going up that steep ascent out of the cave. And that is the level of uh, what he would call understanding, which is more like understanding theories and principles, because similar to the, the cave allegory, as you're going up the ascent, you can see sunlight in the wide open mouth of the cave, but you can't yet see what's out there. So you can try to imagine that you're guided by that light, if you will, but you don't yet know what's out there. You're only working with theories. And so it's that initial level of purification, whereas Athena represents that exit out of the cave into the world of absolute realities, entering the world of intellect. And prudence is an old word for wisdom. So Thomas Keller often used this word where modern translators would use wisdom. So it imparts wisdom and, or sorry, intellect and true wisdom. 
So these are the two festivals. Now they're promising this night festival. They never do go there. Here's that last paragraph again we saw before where Polemarchus mentioned the night festival. Notice the way he's talking about it. It's not anything deep and meaningful, right? At the earlier festival for Artemis, Socrates prayed. He was taking the, the festival in a very serious, solemn way recognizing it's significant to the goddess of purification, or this first goddess. Now, the second night festival is an even higher level of purification. It should be more solemn, and yet the way they're talking about it, it's like they're going to the state fair. They're going to hang out, see the sights, catch up with their friends, have some good conversation. Glaucon's reply to this is that it looks like as if we should have to stay. And then Socrates says, well... If it so be, so be it. Now, I'm not fluent in Greek, but I'm told by people who are that Thomas Taylor's translation is more accurate. He, Socrates says, if it seems so, we ought to do it. And seem here strikes me as significant because it really is stressing that Socrates is not convinced. He is not necessarily interested in going to this to to talk with Polemarchus or to go to the night festival. But he sees that Glaucon does not recognize the injustice of trying to drag them back to Polemarchus's home or to see that they're not actually ready for this higher purification because they still need the earlier one. And so he says, if it seems to you, Glaucon, that we should go back to Polemarchus's house, then that's what we ought to do. I'm going to take you back to that very first line of the dialogue. Directions play a key role. And I think they're chosen very carefully by Plato in this introduction. And going down to the Piraeus, it's like Socrates. This is symbolical. The introduction often introduces the themes that you're going to see throughout the whole dialogue. Socrates is going down into the cave, if you will, when he goes to Polemarchus's house. He's going to pay his devotions to the goddess. Through him, the goddess of purification is going to function because he is going to help them understand what justice is and how to understand what understanding is. We're also going to see that for us, this is a very interactive dialogue. We have to play with this analogy of the city-state to the soul. So we're not just passively reading. We have to be actively involved, and that means that while the characters in the dialogue are going through this process of purification, we, if we choose to take on the more active way of reading it, we are going through that purification as well. And so Socrates is functioning as an agent of this, of Artemis, this um, goddess of purification. And so in that sense, we can say he's paying his devotions. It has this double meaning. Okay, that said, they go to Cephalus' home. Cephalus is the father, and Polemarchus and his brothers live there, and a bunch of their other friends are there as well. Here's Socrates' description of seeing Cephalus. He says, I thought him much aged, for it was a long time since I had seen him. He was sitting on a sort of chair with cushions, and he had a chaplet on his head, for he had just finished sacrificing in the court. Sacrificing, we're going to see, plays a key role in the way Cephalus functions in this dialogue. He has only a few pages in this dialogue. He's going to leave very quickly, and we never see him again in the dialogue. But the way he functions is significant in the introduction here. So he's presented as the patriarch of the family, and he's seen as the wise one. And it's an interesting presentation of him that Plato gave us because as you're reading it, if you just read it quickly, you can easily buy into the image of him as a wise man. But if you read it more carefully, especially as you go later into the dialogue, if you come back, as you see some of the themes, you come back and you see those themes playing out here and you realize he's not as wise as he seems on the surface. Okay, so here's an example. He says this to, to Socrates. He says, I would have you know that for my part, as the satisfactions of the body decay, in the same measure, my desire for the pleasures of good talk and my delight in them increase. 
Don't refuse then, but be yourself a companion to these lads and make our house your resort and regard us as your very good friends and intimates. So on the surface, it seems like he values he values philosophy, he values wisdom talk, or talk about wisdom, and it seems like he's part of this tradition. However, look at it more carefully. Um, I think many of you have seen my video on the four virtues, and much of that was taken from this dialogue. And we're going to see the virtues discussed in detail in book four. It's introduced here, the idea of temperance. The proper definition of it, the Plato's definition of it, is that the desires naturally fall in line with what is good and healthy for the soul. However, what Cephalus is describing here is that the satisfactions of the body decay as we age. So in other words, he is an intemperate man who is finally getting free of some of his desires because he's aging. But he says that in the same measure, his desires for pleasure talk, the, or the pleasure of talking increases as the body's um, satisfaction or the desires of the body decrease. But then the very next sentence, he's not saying that he wants to talk to Socrates. It seems like that should follow if he has more interest now, if his interest in this sort of talk is increasing, it sounds like now he wants to have this kind of talk. But he doesn't. Instead, he says, yeah, talk to these young people. He himself doesn't want to talk. And so he's not actually expressing that he himself has this interest. His desires still go in that other direction. It's just that they're starting to wane. And so he's starting to have more conversations. As they go on talking, Cephalus brings up Sophocles, a poet. And he remembers hearing that Sophocles the poet was greeted by a fellow who asked, how about your service to Aphrodite, Sophocles? Is your natural force still abated? That's a nice way to put it, isn't it? And he replied, hush, man. Most gladly have I escaped this thing you talk of, as if I had run away from a raging and savage beast of a master. Okay, well, here is Cephalus's interpretation of what he thinks Sophocles meant. When the fierce tensions of the passions and desires relax, then is the word of Sophocles approved, and we are rid of many mad masters. Now, on the surface, this is one of those examples where if you just read it quickly, on the surface, it does seem that this is what Sophocles was saying. I'm going to show you again Sophocles' quote so we can match them up. The first thing that stands out as different is that Sophocles was using the singular. He's talking about a single master, whereas Cephalus is talking about many. Now, I think the way Cephalus is talking here very much matches most people's conventional way of thinking. We're thinking of desires as a plural. There are many of them. Whereas what Sophocles is talking about is not the same thing. What he's actually talking about is a state of mind in which the desires are the master or leader of the soul. And we see, remember, with um, when we're talking about temperance, what well, the desires naturally fall in line with wisdom, and it is wisdom that guides the soul. And so it's a very different state of mind. So he's saying that he escaped this unhealthy state of mind where the soul is guided by its desires. He ran away. He escaped. These are active. What Cephalus is talking about is passive. It's something that happens to you. The tensions of the passions and desires relax. It happens to you. His desires have only waned because he's getting old. So he is describing, Cephalus is describing the state of mind of a person who is not temperate, but is starting to age. Whereas Sophocles is describing the state of mind of someone who has actively chosen a healthier state of mind. So what they're actually saying is quite different, but Cephalus doesn't see it. As they go on talking, I'm jumping ahead a bit here, Cephalus gives us this definition of justice. Not to cheat any man, even unintentionally, or play him false. Not remaining in debt to a god for some sacrifice, or to a man for money. So to depart in fear to that other world. 
To this result, he says, the possession of property contributes not a little. So what he's showing here is that his idea of what the benefit of being wealthy is that he can do the sacrifices. Remember when we first met him, he had just come in from the sacrifice, from doing sacrifices. He's paying a lot of money to for various rituals, very um, spiritual rituals and sacrifices. He is afraid of what's going to happen to him when he dies. He's filled with fear. Um, Socrates is going to poke some holes into this definition of justice, and Cephalus very quickly gives up and he leaves. He leaves the conversation to his son, Polomarchus. He says, I may go over the whole argument to you, for it's time for me to once again attend the sacrifices. The guy is really afraid of dying. Okay, so now he's out of the whole dialogue, and now Polomarchus is going to take over and give us his definition of justice. He starts off by saying it's to render to each his due. Socrates quickly um, gets him to change and to maybe tighten it up a bit, saying it means to do good to friends and evil to enemies. Well, Socrates can find quite a bit wrong with it. For example, it's hard to know who is good and who is bad, who is a friend and who is a true enemy. And so he points out that people often make mistakes in this matter so that many seem good who are not and the reverse. And there's some back and forth with this. And then finally, Socrates just throws the whole argument aside, saying, when would you ever want to harm anybody? Is it then the part of a good man to harm anybody whatsoever? And he gives some examples. Horses is one of them. When horses are harmed, does it make them better or worse? It makes them worse. And they go through some other examples, and then they come around to this conclusion. It must be admitted, my friend, that men who are harmed become more unjust. Now, I do want to point out here that harming someone is different from a punishment that is just. And the dialogue Gorgias did go into the value of punishment when it is just. I do have a video on that. It's in the early dialogues for those who haven't seen it. Okay, going back here. Um, another man jumps into the conversation, Thrasymachus. Now, he is more of like the realist, the, um, the, man, the tough guy who is street smart, and he's not satisfied with those politically correct um, definitions that uh, Polemarchus was giving. He comes in to say, I affirm that the just is nothing else than the advantage of the stronger. Now, by the time we get to the end of this dialogue, book 10, we're going to see that Socrates' definition of justice is actually not all that different. However, they have very different meanings because what Thrasymachus means by the word advantage is quite different from what Socrates means. And same with the word stronger. So for Thrasymachus, stronger is in the ways that we generally think of it as having power to hurt others, like the tyrant is the strongest person. Whereas for Socrates, the stronger person is the one who has justice in the soul, and virtue in the soul. And the advantage, of course, is also quite different. For Symmachus is looking at social advantage, having power in society, having wealth and status and everything that goes with it. Whereas for Socrates, the advantage is the health of the soul. So Socrates cannot agree with this definition because it has such a different meaning to for Symmachus. However, he does acknowledge that the just is something that is of advantage. Well, then Socrates is going to bring in a lot of his usual examples, like the pilot of a ship and a physician and so on. He wants to introduce the idea of art. Now, I did do a video a few weeks back. It was on the Phaedrus, where I talked about dialectic, and I pulled out a few quotes from the Republic to show what Plato's definition is of art. And I took that from this section, so there's a bit of overlap. So those of you who have seen the other video, here's a little bit of review for you. So Socrates says, then for each of these things, like the pilot and the physician and so on, for each of them, is there not a something that is for his advantage? Quite so. And is it not also true that the art naturally exists for this, to discover and provide for each his advantage? Yes, for this. Now, Socrates goes on to point out that there is no defect or error at all that dwells in any art, nor does it benefit an art to seek the advantage of anything else than that of its object. 
but the art itself is free from all harm and admixture of evil and is right so long as each art is precisely and entirely that which it is now, some people may practice their art incorrectly and there's the error but the art itself has no defect in sin. and consider the matter in that precise way of speaking with referring to something as it said earlier is it so or not and he says it appears to be and socrates goes on medicine does not consider the advantage of medicine but of the body yes nor horsemanship of horsemanship but of horses nor does any other art look out for itself for it has no need since it has no defect but it looks out for that of which it is the art so it seems but surely, Thrasymachus, the arts do hold rule and are stronger than that of which they are the arts. He conceded this, but it went very hard, Socrates tells us. Then no art considers or enjoins the advantage of the stronger, but every art, that of the weaker, which is ruled by it. So art always is to benefit its object. Thrasymachus goes on. He's not ready to give up yet. He says, you must look at the matter, my simple-minded Socrates, in this way, that the just man always comes out at a disadvantage in his relation with the unjust. Well, to address this point, Socrates again has to go back to the idea of art. Oh, sorry, I have another point here. Sorry. For it is not the fear of doing, but of suffering wrong, that calls for the reproaches of those who revile injustice. So Thrasymachus is starting to defend injustice. He's going to do it even stronger later. Okay, now Socrates is going to go back to his idea of art. And he's going to refer to politicians here. The they he's referring to is politicians. And he's going to talk about them in a way that is rather idealistic because he's talking about the true art of politics. I'm sure I'm not the only one who wishes that our true politicians actually thought this way and acted this way. But he goes on to say that these politicians, they do not wish to collect pay openly for their service of rule and be styled hirelings, nor to take it by stealth from their office and be called thieves, nor yet for the sake of honor, for they're not covetous of honor. So there must be imposed some compulsion and penalty to constrain them to rule if they are to consent to hold office. That is perhaps why to seek office oneself and not away compulsion is thought disgraceful. But the chief penalty is to be governed by someone worse if a man will not himself hold office and rule. It is from fear of this, as it appears to me, that the better sort hold office when they do. And from this Socrates concludes, in very truth, the true ruler does not naturally seek his own advantage, but that of the ruled. Notice he's talking about the true ruler. But that doesn't necessarily apply to politicians as they function in our own home countries. All right, they don't naturally seek advantage, but they seek for the advantage of the ruled, so that every man of understanding would rather choose to be benefited by another than to be bothered with benefiting him. This point, then, I by no means concede to Thrasymachus, that justice is the advantage of the superior. Okay, now Thrasymachus has dropped his mask. He's ready to defend injustice as the higher virtue. He says, tell me, then, how you would express yourself on this point about justice and injustice. You call one of them, I presume, a virtue and the other a vice? Of course. Justice the virtue and injustice the vice? It is likely, you innocent, when I say that injustice pays and justice doesn't pay. But what then, pray? The opposite. What? Justice? Vice? No, but a noble simplicity or a goodness of heart. Then do you call injustice badness of heart? No, but goodness of judgment, he says. And so Socrates replies, I mustn't flinch from following out the logic of the inquiry, so long as I conceive you to be saying what I think. For now, Thrasymachus, I absolutely believe that you are not mocking us, but telling us your real opinions about the truth. Okay, so Thrasymachus has dropped his mask. Okay, so here's how Socrates addresses it. 
Consider then with regard to all forms of knowledge and ignorance, whether you think that any one who knows would choose to do or say other or more than what another who knows would do or say, and not rather exactly what his like would do in the same action. Why, perhaps it must be so in such cases. But what of the ignorant man, of him who does not know? Would he not overreach or outdo equally the knower and the ignorant? It may be. But the one who knows is wise, I'll say, and the wise is good, I'll say so. And he who is good and wise will not wish to overreach his like, but his unlike and opposite. It seems so. And it goes on. But the bad man and the ignoramus will overreach both like and unlike, so it appears. And does not our unjust man, Trasimachus, overreach both unlike and like? Did you not say that? I did. But the just man is like the wise and good, and the unjust is like the bad and ignoramus. It seems likely. But furthermore, we agree that each is such is that to which he is like. Yes, we did. Then the just man has turned out on our hands to be good and wise, and the unjust man bad and ignorant. Well, Socrates is not done yet. He said, he asks, what is the nature of injustice as compared with justice? And then Socrates builds to this conclusion. He says that factions are the outcome of injustice and hatreds and internecine conflicts. But justice brings oneness of mind and love. Now, I pulled out this quote because this is a theme that is going to come up again and again, and it has its correlates in metaphysics. The idea that whatever is good and just brings oneness of mind. That um, everything that exists, exists through, um, through its oneness, through its unity. Whereas when things are, when they lack unity, when they break up, then you have the opposite condition. Internecine conflicts refers to conflicts in which everybody involved is injured. And so the outcomes of factions, of lack of unity, is always going to be something negative, whereas unity brings goodness. And so that theme is going to come up again and again, and I'll talk about it more when it comes up later. Okay, but all the same, we must examine it more carefully. For it is no ordinary matter that we're discussing, but the right conduct of life. Is there anything else with which you can see except the eyes? Certainly not. Again, could you hear with anything but ears? By no means. Take note now. Could the eyes possibly fulfill their function well if they lacked their own proper excellence and had in its stead the defect? How could they? For I presume you meant blindness instead of vision. Whatever the excellence may be, for we have not yet come to that question, but I'm only asking whether whatever operates will not do its own work well by its own virtue and badly by its own defect. That much you may safely affirm to be true. Then the ears too, if deprived of their own virtue, will do their work ill? Assuredly. And do we then apply the same principle to all things? I think so. And so now they can move on to the soul. The soul has it a work which you couldn't accomplish with anything else in the world. As, for example, management, rule, deliberation, and the like, and again life, shall we say that too is the function of the soul? So we have here various functions of the soul, including management, rule, deliberation, life. And Socrates goes on. Do we not also say that there is an excellence or virtue of the soul? We do. Will the soul ever accomplish its own work well if deprived of its own virtue? Or is this impossible? It is impossible. Of necessity, then, a bad soul will govern and manage things badly, while the good soul will in all these things do well. Of necessity. And did we not agree that the excellence or virtue of soul is justice and its defect injustice? Yes, we did. The just soul and the just man, then, 
will live well and the unjust ill. And this is what and excuse me, Thrasymachus at this point has pretty much given up. He says it appears by your reasoning. So he's not convinced, but he's done arguing. He's given up. So he's unsatisfied with where things have ended off. Socrates also is unsatisfied. And here's how book one ends. I, methinks, before finding the first object of our inquiry, what justice is, let go of that and set out to consider something about it namely whether it is vice and ignorance or wisdom and virtue. And again, when later the view is sprung upon us that injustice is more profitable than justice, I could not refrain from turning to that from the other topic. So that for me, the present outcome of the discussion is that I know nothing, for I do not know what the just is, for if I do not know, excuse me, what the just is, I shall hardly know whether it is a virtue or not and whether its possessor is or is not happy. And so nobody is satisfied with where things ended. They still have to figure out what the just is. And that is what they're going to pick up in chapter, I'm sorry, in book two. And so I do hope you'll join me next week when we get into book two. If you have any questions or comments, as always, feel free to leave them in the comments section or drop me an email. And if you like what you saw, I would appreciate a thumbs up. And also, um, please think about subscribing if you don't already. I do put out a video once a week. So I hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much.